evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. A nice full hall is always good. Um, I'd like to start this evening by giving a, an extremely short uh, account of my activities I do for, for each meeting. Uh, you've already had some of the first slide announced. My name is Mike Lawrence. Uh, I campaigned against the religious indoctrination of children in schools under a banner name of Notori, which is No to Religious Indoctrination. It's a huge organisation, members of one, me. <laughs> Um, I'd like to say I campaign very hard, but obviously it falls on deaf ears in our current uh, political climate. Uh, I can be found on the internet at notori.co.uk. Other items I campaign against are bishops in the House of Lords, faith school expansion, enforced worship in schools and special privileges for organised religion. So I need to stay up front after having uh, <laughs> demonstrated that. that I fully support the concept of freedom of religion, and I would defend that in any debate, without doubt. But only if it comes hand in hand with freedom from religion also. And my campaign items are where I feel the freedom from religion criteria fails in the UK today, and hence why I campaign against it. So on to tonight. The title of tonight's presentation is The Church of England, Theocratic Power, Religious Bigotry, Slavery and Education. So if you like, it could be considered an alternative history to the Church of England, to the one that we would be taught through our schools and from sermons. Its purpose is to create the distinction between Christianity, which I would consider being a practicing Christian, and churchianity, which is self-appointed religious organizations amassing wealth and power by selling Christianity. And I would contend that uh, Churchianity should not exist at all, because Christianity is an idea, it's an ideology, it doesn't belong to anybody to sell to the public in the first instance. So, to explain that distinction a little further, at the absolute base level, the only criteria a person requires to be a Christian are the ability to read in any modern printed language, access to the content of the New Testament in that particular language, and the good fortune to live in a country which allows freedom of speech and conscience, where people can form views and express them freely and debate, which we do have in the United Kingdom. Any person could then freely acquire the content of the New Testament and read it, and based on their own desires or their own thoughts, they could decide, I like the message, uh, I believe the concept, I will be a Christian. Or they could say, actually, I don't believe that's where morals come from, it's not the way I see the world, and I won't. And that's a free choice to everybody. None of those um, concepts requires the existence of a self-appointed, multi-billion pound organisation. An organisation which exists to actually instruct people exactly how they should interpret the content of the New Testament, lest they interpret it incorrectly, heaven forbid, mm -hmm. according to the view of the self-appointed, multi-billion pound organisation. So, viewed from this angle, the Church of England and their sidekick, the Roman Catholic Church worldwide, are merely feeding troughs. The higher echelons of these two organisations encourage the followers to fill the trough up so that they can partake of the offerings to satisfy their basic needs of food, clothing and shelter. And some. They do tend to like some gold, they like land, building and investment accounts. And how well they do this. They're both very good at it. Now, here's the interesting thing. Nowhere in the scripture that both of these organisations promote and make money from does it actually instruct them to do this. In fact, quite the reverse. Now, I'll do this quite quickly. It's just four short verses, but, so I don't want to bore you with uh, literature. But Matthew 6.1 <clears throat> Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of people in order to be noticed by them. Whenever you give to the poor, do not blow a trumpet before you like the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they will be praised by people. Do your giving in secret. 6.5, and when you pray, you should not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets so they will be seen by men. But you, when you pray, go into your closet, shut your door and pray to your father in secret. Uh, Mark 6.7, and he called to him the twelve, Jesus called the twelve apostles, and he began to send them out to evangelise. He charged them to take nothing with them for their journey, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts. 
which is exactly how our bishops travel, and the Pope by private jet. Uh, Matthew 19.21 Jesus said to the young rich man, If you would be perfect, go and sell all of what you possess and give it to the poor. Um, notice he says give it to the poor, not a large proportion of it to the church and some to the poor. So, Christianity was always the intended message. Whether the theology is correct or not, the message was Christianity. Churchianity was never the intended goal. Now, uh, I don't particularly like labels, but I suppose I'm labelled an atheist, and I have to accept that. Uh, as far as the description of an atheist goes, I am an atheist. Um, I'm also called a mythicist. I found out I didn't know that. <laughs> that doesn't mean I actually like myths and believe myths to be true. What it means is, personally, I don't believe the actual figurehead of Christianity was ever a figure from history. I believe he, he started as a myth, he was euhemerized into a, a supposed person, and then uh, three or four hundred years after this event, uh, a particular Roman emperor liked the idea of theology, and since then we were all forced upon pain of death or torture to believe it to be true. But let's hypothesize that I'm wrong here, that this person did exist, he wasn't the son of God because that's ridiculous. <coughs> like Gandhi, he preached a really nice message, people liked it, and he was executed for sedition. If that person came back today and saw the organisation of the Church of England and the Roman Catholic Church, I think he would be appalled. I certainly don't think he'd want to be a member, and I certainly think the two organisations probably wouldn't want to accept him as a member either. either so, Just a bit of contrast there between what I would call Christianity and Churchianity. So, <coughs> excuse me, on to the Church of England and their involvement in education. In 2011, the Church of England announced with absolute pride and gusto the 200th anniversary of the creation by the Church of free education for all children in England and Wales. And they reported this event as an act of pure put my teeth in, philanthropy. They reported it as a desire from the Church to give something of itself to the nation. In the 2011 Special Bicentenary Service Address, Mr Rowan Williams, who was the Archbishop at the time, described this 1811 church initiative in the following manner. I'll play a short video, I promise you it's only two minutes long, but it does give us some idea of how the church of today are telling us this initiative came about. Now we believe that a church school, the kind of school that the National Society has been involved in for two centuries, a church school is a place where you see people in context. You see them as people that God wants to spend time with. And I suppose it was this that was very much in the minds of the people who founded the National Society. Yes, they believed that the young people of this country needed to be educated. Yes, they believed that it was somehow inhuman and unjust to send children into the mines and the farms and up chimneys and all the rest of it because there was so much more to children than that. They looked at the children of this country and they saw. And it's such a tragedy and such a terrible judgment really on the generations that went before that they had looked at so many children and never seen them. Never seen what they really were, who they really were. And the people who founded the National Society certainly wanted to educate children to be good citizens. They wanted them to grow up, as we were reminded right at the beginning of this service. They wanted them to grow up, to have a voice, in society, to be useful, creative members of the whole community. And so they gave them the skills that they might need to have a voice, to play a part in the wider community. Okay, so that's Mr. Ryan Williams telling us that the reason the Church of England in two, uh, 1811 set up uh, education for children was that they were concerned about the plight of the children. They were being used for manual labour at the ages of, uh, I suppose, 
11 onwards, possibly even younger, working seven days a week in the Industrial Revolution, and they weren't being educated, and that concerned the church. So, is Mr. Williams correct? Was it a philanthropic act? Well, a closer analysis of the events of the time tells a very different story. In actual fact, it says he's completely wrong. So having heard the Church of England of today present their interpretation of the rationale behind the creation of church schools, let's now review the Church of England's initial statement of intent with regards to general education back in 1811. Uh, here is a copy of the literary panorama for December 1811, and it records the presentations for and the debates on the education of Church of oh, Big Pond, the creation of Church of England schools. So, national and parliamentary notices, prospective and retrospective, national education, including the religious principles of the established church. Now, I've read the entire article, it's, it's rather large, but it's summed up in the next slide. Uh, the, the flavour and the ethos of the next slide is the flavour of the entire argument, and there is nothing else outside of this. That the national religion should be made the foundation of national education, and should be the first and the chief thing taught to the poor, according to the excellent liturgy and catechism provided by our church for that purpose, must be admitted by all friends to the establishment. For if the great body of the nation be educated in other principles than those of the established church, capital E, capital C, the natural consequence must be to alienate the minds of the people from it, or render them indifferent to it, which may, in succeeding generations, prove fatal to the church. That is the flavour of the entire argument. Okay. Other principles that he refers to there are the anti-church literature and rhetoric that's coming from the Enlightenment of the 17th and 18th centuries. So this statement is quite clear on the matter. Rowan Williams is wrong. The church had no concern at all for the hardships of the children. In fact, there's nothing on record that shows they did anything to try and uh, alleviate the plight of these children <coughs> other than want to take control of the education. This was an initiative for self-preservation, not philanthropy. At the same time, as this was being debated in Parliament, there was also an expansion of church building. During the 19th century, Britain saw a rapid growth in the number of Church of England churches throughout England and Wales. So we could reasonably ask, um, why was there so much building and restoration of churches in the 19th century? James Bentley, PhD, points out that in the 19th century in Britain, there was still a great fear and suspicion of Roman Catholics, and a staunchly religious and Protestant parliament and monarchy perceived a sense of competition from the Roman Catholic Church and from non-conformist Anglicans. In the 18th and the early 19th century, the Church of England held the sway of theocratic power. They had a vice-like grip over Parliament. Catholics and non-conformist Protestants were not permitted office in the House of Commons or any other national or local uh, office. Uh, the law forbid it. It was the Test Act. In actual fact, there was quite a few Test Acts, and what the Test Act did, uh, if you were going to take public office, it was a test of your religious allegiance. You had to prove that you were a Church of England Protestant before you were allowed to be a local MP or a local councillor or any other public office. In 1828, in response to events that were happening in Ireland, the Test Acts were amended and Catholics were finally allowed to take office in, in uh, public roles. After 1828, the privilege was also extended to Jews and finally to atheists. Yay! <laughs> we got to say, the first atheist being Charles Bradmore, who of course is the founder of the National Society. And interestingly, he was actually returned as an MP three times, and the first two occasions, basically, Parliament said, no, you're an atheist. He took his seat on the third occasion, but he took his seat and he voted without first taking the uh, religious oath of allegiance for which he was placed in prison. Mm -hmm. Nice people. So, why am I telling you this? It's important to note that here, prior to 1828, which is the period we are interested in, 1811, the House of Commons was 100% religious, 100% Protestant, and 100% Church of England. That's quite important. The law of the land guaranteed this, regardless of the religious stroke, uh, pick upon stroke, non-religious makeup of the population at the time. 
And even after the concessions from 1828 onwards, the make of the house would have still been the majority Church of England for the rest of the century. So when the Church of England tried to absolve themselves of uh, some of the, the atrocities that were committed by our Parliament uh, from 1811 backwards, they actually can't do that because they were intrinsic to it. At the start of the 19th century, the population's perception of religion was changing as people began to soak up the strong counter-arguments of the Enlightenment. Here are just some names that were putting forward alternative views which didn't require an organised church. <clears throat> Enlightenment views were reaching the masses and they were taking effect and national support for religion was beginning to fade. Church pews were emptying and some churches became derelict. And this was a situation as far as the religiously biased uh, parliament and monarchy, monarchy of the early 19th century were concerned, needed to be addressed with positive counteraction. This counteraction came to fruition with the restoration of disuse and the construction of new Church of England churches on a stack scale that's quite hard to comprehend. And this was along with awarding the Church of England the contract to indoctrinate children on an industrial scale under the guise of general education. And it was uh, indoctrination. This education was scripture, 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 a little bit of maths, scripture, a little bit of English, scripture, morning prayers. That's what these children were subject to. So they did come out being able to add up, take away, do a bit of reading. But even the reading was taught by way of reference to the Bible. For the churches, work started in 1808. By 1872, 3,204 new churches had been built and 925 disused churches had been entirely restored. So that's 4,129 new Church of England churches at an average of about one and a quarter new churches per week over a 64 year period. And this added to the 10,000 churches that they already possessed. It was at an estimated cost of about 24 million pounds which would uh, extrapolate out to being in excess of £1 billion in today's terms. The New Churches Act of 1818 allocated £1 million of taxpayers' money to the fund. Uh, presumably more taxpayers' money followed than the rest was made up from the coffers of the Church of England. Now, contrast this huge spend of church and public funds on building up the Church of England's portfolio of Houses of God with the time frame and the events of the Irish famine. Remember, Ireland was part of the United Kingdom at the time. They were British subjects. The famine lasted from 1845 to 1852, inside this church building programme time frame. It was caused by a Europe-wide potato blight, but it was fatal in Ireland because Ireland's agricultural structure was potato-based, solely potato-based. The blight struck large areas of Ireland in 1845, and it was near total in 1849. The Prime Minister of the time, Robert Peel, not a bad character, he ignored the corn laws and he secretly imported corn from America to help alleviate the suffering, and he set up feeding programmes. But then, on the 30th of June, 1846, after a general election, John Russell became the Prime Minister, and he halted the food and relief programme, and he left the people of Ireland to their own devices. His assistant secretary to the Treasury, responsible for administering relief to the millions of Irish peasants, Sir Charles Trevelyan, stated in a letter to Lord Monteagle, the judgment of God sent the calamity to teach the Irish a lesson. If only they would have been Protestants, all would have been well. He also said in this letter, it is an effective mechanism for reducing surplus population. Shocking, isn't it? So, the Christian Parliament, of the richest nation on earth at the time, chose to ignore the plight of its starving people, and together with the Church of England decided that the creation of 4,129 new churches to add to the portfolio of 10,000 that it already had was a far better spend of public and church money than uh, creating feeding stations in Ireland. And as a result of this, I would say, arrogant religious bigotry by the leaders of the country and the established church, more than one million Irish men, women and children suffered slow agonising deaths due to starvation and starvation-related illnesses. And more than a million more were forced to leave their homes, uh, leave their land and property behind and emigrate. And this actually caused a massive land grab from the rich and wealthy of the, the country to grab the land that had been left behind vacant. 
also running concurrently with the church restoration and building program, in 1807 the parochial schools bill was being debated in Parliament with a motion that uh, the state should offer an education facility to all children in order to help the poor improve their standard of living and so help themselves out of poverty. Uh, and it's important to note here that this is 1807. The church did not create the schools until 1811. Basically, the churches were saying, if this is going to pass and this is going to become law, we want to be in charge of it so that we can uh, censor and temper the information that the children are going to receive in effect. Uh, the bill initially received opposition in two areas, actually. Firstly, there were some pretty vile characters in the House of Commons at the time, and this guy is particularly vile, uh, who argued that educating the poor would be folly. Said, because it would give them the means with which to be unhappy with the life that station, uh, specified and the station that life had allocated them. And it would therefore be unkind of us to do that. Uh, they postulated that the nation needed the poor to stay uneducated in order that they could continue to conduct their manual labours absent, uh, labours with gratitude, absent such knowledge and ideas that could possibly turn them rebellious. Heaven forbid we upset the apple cart by educating the poor. This is what the man actually said in Parliament. For however specious in theory the project might be of giving education to the labouring classes of the poor, it would in effect be found to be prejudicial to their morals and happiness. It would teach them to despise their lot in life. Instead of making them good servants in agriculture and other laborious employments to which their rank in society had destined them. Instead of teaching them subordination, instead of teaching them subordination, it would render them factious and refractory. As was evident in the manufacturing counties, it would enable them to read seditious pamphlets, vicious books and publications against Christianity. Please make a note of that, we're going to come to that again in a little while. Publications against Christianity. It would render them insolent to their superiors, and in a few years the result would be that the legislator would find it necessary to direct the strong arm of power towards them, and to furnish the ex uh, executive magistrates with much more vigorous laws than were now in force. Nice person. <laughs> now, we mustn't be fooled in thinking that this is just one bad apple in the whole car. Not a bit of it. This view from the religiously bigoted in high office was not just the thoughts of uh, the staunchly Church of England wealthy classes, it was endemic of the time. Consider the verse from the hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful, which has long since been removed to the hymn due to the vile sentiment of the prose. The rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate. God made them high and lowly and ordered their estate. This is basically saying, God decided that I would be superior to you and he, di he dictated that you would be inferior and you just have to be quiet and accept it. This hymn was written by the wife of the Bishop of Derby in 1848 and this particular verse is truly disgusting. So, please note, as I said earlier at this stage, MP William Davis Giddy's concern over the masses being able to read publications against Christianity if taught how to read. So this demonstrates two facts to us. Such publications existed in 1807 in enough quantity as to cause such concern as a result of the Enlightenment from the tail end of the 18th century, and it concerned Parliament that, and the clergy that people were reading them and taking note of them. Not all of the people that were writing these pamphlets were actually atheists, some of them were deists. They were, as I said at the beginning of the, the, the evening, they were saying, we don't accept the need for an established church for someone to be a Christian. So we don't understand why this organisation actually exists. And you could argue that these pamphlets were kind of the internet of the day, because they had an effect and people were questioning, finally questioning the dogma, and they were uh, abandoning the churches. A second concern over the bill came from MPs with slightly more humane personalities and agendas who argued that it should be the duty of the, the nation to offer the chance of education to all of its citizens, but they would not support the bill because the cost would be prohibitive to the nation. So the Marquis of Titchfield added, I think much benefit might result from general education, but that benefit might cost too dear. Likewise, feeding the starving Irish, which obviously was uh, too dear, but spending £12 million on 4,000 new churches was a mere snip. 
Now, the Church of England observed the proceedings from the sidelines with the utmost interest. In 1811, the Church of England created the National Society for Promoting Religious Education with a stated mission of supplying free education to the children of the masses. But let's take note of the name. The National Society for Promoting Religious Education, not Promoting Education. Now, we leave education to one side for the moment. We'll come back to it later. Let's now look at the message of the Church of England of love, charity and forgiveness. Because in my mind, this is a, a rebranding of the core message. That was never the intention of the early church. And it's actually quite a recent rebranding. For 1,600 years, the Catholic Church, and in Britain, the, the spin-off Church of England, put forward their views on the Jesus character and Christianity in the most vicious, forceful and merciless manner. But consider this image here. It's uh, an ecclesiastical courtroom inside Chester Cathedral. So this isn't a secular courtroom. This is inside a cathedral. This is an ecclesiastical courtroom for ecclesiastical matters. And with it comes this plaque explaining uh, the purpose and its function. We note the last line that I've highlighted there. It says, punishments included fines such as sixpence for not attending church. Not attending church was a crime, and you got fined for it. Heresy was punishable by death. And I, and I have heard many clergy people saying that uh, the death penalty was passed out by the secular courts. The ecclesiastical courts passed the death penalties for heresy. Now, being murdered by the church authorities for disagreeing with their theology it speaks for itself when we're trying to demonstrate the, the vicious and cruel nature of the early church. But the fine for not attending church should not be dismissed as trivial. In the age we're talking about here, a sixpence fine for the local pauper population would have probably uh, amounted to financial ruin and uh, ensuing destitution. So it pretty much ensured everyone was going to turn up to church on Sunday. So, without any doubt, the current persona of love, forgiveness and charity portrayed by the present incumbents uh, with inside the Church of England is a very recent significant rebranding and a disowning of past atrocities of an organisation that was until a mere 90 years ago, and that's the shocking part, vile, inhumane and thoroughly greedy. Why 90 years ago? John William Gott uh, was sentenced three times to hard labour for uh, blasphemy. And his, his last imprisonment in 1921 uh, just after his release in 1922, he, broke a, a, he died a broken man. Um, so, three spells of hard labour, purely for blasphemy, in uh, 1921. That's just over 90 years ago. So, due to the duress with which it forced its station, the Church of England was more than happy to leave education as a luxury for the rich, as it had been prior to 1811 for centuries. The rich got to send their children to pretty good schools, the poor, they had to go to work. The mindset of the masses, the poor, was well in line with church dogma, and in no way considering a move away from church adherence, and why would they? It cost them sixpence if they didn't attend Sunday service. But then, originating from France and later other countries, came the Enlightenment. And eminent educated people began to challenge the position of the church in society, and more worryingly for the church, its core message. Uh, this is a, an image of Thomas Paine, it's from, uh, it's from Norfolk. Thomas Paine himself wasn't uh, an atheist, he was a deist. He believed, he was the guy of the, the old, believed God created the world and that was it. He's got no more interest in it or in us and we don't need to worship it. And he questioned the need for a church. Other people in the Enlightenment were actually outright atheists and you know, the whole thing is incorrect. And they were creating pamphlets, they were disseminating them, people were reading them and the churches were becoming empty. So, we should therefore strongly question the assertion put forward at the beginning of the programme by Rowan Williams that the creation of the National Society and subsequently the church controlled education, I won't say church education, the church controlled education of all children of the working classes in England and Wales was a yearning from the church to offer a gift of itself to the nation. It was not. It was a knee-jerk reaction to the effects of the Enlightenment. It was the Christian indoctrination of children on an industrial scale with a little bit of English and maths thrown in and it was utterly successful. Now, if we consider the time period, the grandchildren of the children that were put through this process are actually our grandparents today. 
Hence that the that age group in our country is largely Christian in one sense or another. But as we come down the age groups, the the level of religiosity drops. So this is where we can compare the internet of today and as the lady was saying there, that children are now being started to talk critical thinking in schools with the pamphlets of 1811. Hopefully they're having the same effect. But hopefully we won't get a, a, another tranche of religious indoctrination in the next few years to try and reverse that trend. So that's the Church of England and education. Let's now look at the Church of England and slavery. Uh, I've heard many times, and maybe people in this room have as well, that the defenders of church-based Christianity arguing that, hey, give us some credit, you know, Christianity actually stopped the African slave trade. That, that is quite a popular soundbite. But it's a soundbite delivered purely on the basis that the main character in the fight against slavery in the House of Commons, William Wilberforce, was a Christian. Well, of course he was. If he was not a Christian, he would not have been allowed to be an MP and he would not have been able to push the motion. Yeah? There may have been many atheists that thought slavery was wrong, but they couldn't get a seat in the House of Commons. Only through Parliament could the slave trade be stopped, so it was only ever going to be a Christian by default who would eventually lead the cause in the House. What we have to ask the Church of England, and the supporters of the Church of England, is why did William Wilberforce need to fight for 21 years to get the, the rest of the Christians in the House of Commons to agree that slavery was wrong? And not only that, another 26 years to agree to free the existing slaves throughout, slaves throughout the British Empire. It should have been an absolute no-brainer. You know, slavery is cruel, it's morally wrong. What was there to discuss and debate for 47 years amongst the Christian elite of the country? It gets worse. In 1811, Charles Manners Sutton was the Archbishop of Canterbury, but he was also the head of the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel to Foreign Parts, which owned hundreds of African slaves that it put to work in the Church of England's own plantations in Barbados, the Codrington plantations. But they would argue that they, were, they, they did a good deed. They introduced these people to Jesus, so when they died, they received their eternal salvation. Unfortunately for these people, they received that eternal salvation a little earlier than they were expecting, due to the treatment that they received. <coughs> and... The slaves belonging to the Church of England, they were easy to identify. They didn't want them being mixed up with other people's slaves. They had the word society branded into their backs with a red hot iron. <clears throat> when the emancipation of the slaves arrived in 1833, the next Archbishop of How uh, Canterbury, William Howley, held out his hand to take £8,558, two shillings and twopence from the taxpayer's purse in compensation to the Church of England for the loss of its stock, being the surviving 410 slaves that it still owned. Um, this uh, information comes courtesy of the National Archives in the University College London, and it was uh, research put together by Dr Draper. Other researchers put that figure in today's terms as £7 million that was handed over to the Church of England to set their slaves free. Now, 410 slaves, if you were to divide that by 410 slaves, that would be £17,000 per slave. Can anyone guess how much the slaves got of that money? Zero. Yeah. Just to show that this isn't just Wikipedia or Google, there's the claim. So, the Honourable Reverend for the Society of the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts. 410 enslaved people. £8,558, two shillings and twopence for the Cordington plantation paid out of the taxpayers' purse to the Church of England. <coughs> now, countless slaves never made it to emancipation and died at the hands of the Church of England's employees on the plantations, and obviously other plantation owners as well, had loads of slaves who died during this process. So... An organisation which professed the sanctity of human life was quite happy to treat the human beings as balance sheet assets and place a price on their worth when they were forced to dispose of such assets. But I suppose the point we're making here is that this organisation's veneer of goodwill, empathy and desire to do good in the world was back then a complete smokescreen and a total sham. The Church of England of 1811 was indeed, as opposed to word, thoroughly ruthless, murderous and vile. 
And as the Archbishop of Canterbury said in the, uh, the opening statement that we heard, they looked at the children and they saw. That's what he said. In this age, they looked at these children and they saw, and they saw profit. They saw profit in human misery. And as we have seen earlier, just as the Church of England branded its name into the backs of its slaves to mark them as Church of England property, so too it wanted to brand its theology into the mind of every child in England and Wales to claim them as fully indoctrinated members of its cult and future spiritual stock. But here's the important thing. It still does today, and we can prove this. When you see television debates such as The Big Question with Nicky Campbell, where they debate the idea of religion in schools, you will always hear from the Church of England and other religious organisations, we need to teach this to teach the children tolerance and to respect religion and people of other religious thoughts. Well, that was completely negated on Monday the 15th of December 2014, when the Archbishop, Justin Welby, visited a Church of England school, primary school, to open a new prayer corner. These are primary school children, uh, what's that, seven to four to seven year olds? This is a primary school. Um, in a church, an adult has the option to sit there or not sit there. These children don't, they have to sit there. This man is standing on a stage as one of their authority figures. We are conditioned at this age to believe what our authority figures tell us. He's in full religious regalia with a nice big cross on the front. And he says to the children, when we pray, Jesus changes things. He changes the world around us. Jesus also changes us when we pray. Jesus is the friend who forgives us when we do wrong things. He lifts us up when things go well. He comforts us when things go wrong. He is our friend who is always with us. He changes the world and he changes us to four to seven year old children. Now, apart from being a case of outright lying to children in their place of education, because everybody knows the only thing that prayer achieves is diddly squat, nothing uh, tangible, this is an example of full on hardcore indoctrination of infant school children by the head of the Church of England himself. And in that instance, he loses all credibility when he says, Religious education is not about indoctrination, it's about teaching children of religion so they can make their own choice. That was not teaching children about religion, that was indoctrination. And so ladies and gentlemen, I'll close tonight's campaign with a proposal. <clears throat> I would propose that now we're in the 21st century, not the 18th or the 19th, we need to take the Church of England's rebranding exercise just a little bit further. We need to ask our government to end church involvement in the education of children, matters of state and the taxpayer's purse. Education should be secular. It should have been secular from the start. Uh, it's unfortunate the Church of England took the reins. They did. We can't do anything about that. But they should let go of those reins. And education should be all-inclusive for children of all backgrounds. And I would point out that if these proposals were instigated, it would not hinder anybody's ability in this country to become a practicing Christian. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. I believe we'll have a break now and then we'll take some, some questions, questions after. Yeah. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.